In the year 43 CE, Rome's expansionist ambitions led it to invade southeastern Britain, marking the beginning of a gradual conquest. This campaign encompassed a range of approaches, from military subjugation to allowing some tribes to maintain a semblance of independence as nominal allies of the Roman Empire. Among these tribes were the Iseni, residing in what is present-day Norfolk. Their king, Prasutagus, had secured a measure of independence by devising a will that bequeathed his lands jointly to his daughters and the Roman Emperor. However, upon his death in 61 CE, the Romans disregarded his will. They ruthlessly seized his lands and subjected his family to degrading humiliation. Prasutagus's widow, Boudica, faced the brutality of flogging, while their daughters suffered the horrors of Roman brutality. Simultaneously, unrelenting Roman financiers in their pursuit of wealth called in their loans, further burdening the Iceni with increased taxation. The flashpoint for revolt occurred when the Roman governor of Britain, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, was engaged in a campaign on the island of Mona, modern-day Anglesey, North Wales. In his absence, the Iceni, under the leadership of the indomitable Boudicca, rose in rebellion. The Iseni found common cause with their neighbors, the Trinovantes, whose former capital, Camulodunum, present-day Colchester, had been transformed into a colony for Roman veterans. Adding insult to injury, the Romans had constructed a temple to honor the former emperor Claudius within the city, all funded by local resources. In response, the rebels descended upon Camulodunum, laying it to waste and showing no mercy to those unable to flee its walls. Boudicca and her resolute army then set their sights on Londinium, modern-day London. Suetonius, with a limited portion of his forces, arrived ahead of the rebels, but concluded that he lacked the strength to defend the city. He issued orders for Londinium's evacuation before the impending attack as a result of which the city was also reduced to ashes and all those who couldn't escape suffered a grim fate. While Boudicca's forces continued their rampage in Verulamium, present-day St. Albans, Suetonius wisely reorganized his troops. According to Tacitus, he amassed a force comprised of his own Legio Fortitive Gemina and any available auxiliaries, totaling around 10,000 men. However, a third legion, Sanoe Augusta, situated near Exeter, failed to come to his aid. Meanwhile, a fourth, Nykite Hispana, had been defeated while attempting to relieve Camulodunum. The sheer magnitude of Boudicca's army was estimated at nearly a quarter of a million strong, setting the stage for a decisive clash. Heavily outnumbered by Boudicca's formidable horde, Suetonius displayed astute military strategy by meticulously selecting the battleground. His chosen location was a narrow gorge with a protective forest behind, opening into a broad plain. This tactical choice effectively shielded the Roman flanks from enemy assault, while the forest posed a considerable obstacle to any rear attack. These measures nullified Boudicca's numerical superiority as it prevented her from bringing her vast forces into close combat. Furthermore, the open plain in front of the Roman lines eliminated the possibility of ambushes. Suetonius deployed his legionaries in close order, reinforced by lightly armed auxiliaries on the flanks and cavalry on the wings. As both armies prepared for the impending confrontation, the commanders endeavored to inspire their troops. The Roman historian Tacitus, writing about the battle roughly 50 years later, recorded, albeit possibly embellished, Boudicca's impassioned speech to her followers. She declared, nothing is safe from Roman pride and arrogance. They will deface the sacred and will deflower our virgins. Win the battle or perish. That is what I, a woman, will do. The Britons arranged their wagon train in a crescent formation at the wider end of the battlefield, where their families could witness the anticipated triumphant victory. 
This tactic was reminiscent of other historical battles, such as the actions of Boyorix of the Cimbri and Ariovistus of the Suebi against Gaius Marius and Julius Caesar, respectively. Death is coming for the lucky ones. Thanks. I feel so much better now. Tacitus also documented Suetonius's address to his legionaries, which exuded practicality and resilience. Suetonius urged his soldiers to disregard the tumult emanating from their adversaries, emphasizing the Britons' lack of true military discipline and equipment. He urged unity and the employment of their javelins, advising them to push forward, shield in hand, to incapacitate their foes and dispatch them with their swords. Booty was to be forgotten. Victory was the paramount goal. With Boudicca at the helm, the Briton army surged forward across the plain, heading directly into the narrowing battlefield for a colossal frontal assault. As they advanced, their numbers concentrated into a dense mass. Get out of your arse! At approximately 40 yards from the Roman lines, the Britons were met with a devastating volley of Roman peeler, specialized javelins designed to bend upon impact with shields. This ingenious design rendered the enemy encumbered with heavy iron spears affixed to their shields, or they were forced to discard them, leaving them vulnerable. Given the limited use of armor among the Britons, this tactic wreaked havoc on their formation. A second volley followed as each Roman legionary carried two pila. With the Britons thrown into disarray, Suetonius promptly ordered his legionaries and auxiliaries to advance, forming the standard Roman wedge formation, their front line resembling the teeth of a handsaw. Their discipline, weapons and armor gave the Romans a distinct advantage in the close quarters combat against the densely packed Britons. The Roman cavalry, lances poised, then entered the fray. As their losses grew, the Britons attempted to retreat, but their escape was thwarted by the encircling wagons, leading to a massacre. The Roman cavalry also struck the Britons from the flanks as the infantry advanced. The Romans did not discriminate in their carnage, targeting not only the warriors, but also the women, children, and even pack animals. Tacitus claimed that around 80,000 Britons perished in contrast to only 400 Romans, a testament to the brutal efficiency of Roman discipline, arms, and strategy. In the wake of the Battle of Watling Street, contrasting accounts of Boudicca's fate emerge. Tacitus suggests that she took her own life by poisoning herself, while Cassius Dio posits that she fell gravely ill and eventually died, receiving an opulent burial. Quinius Postumus, the prefect of the Tuan Legion, which had notably failed to join the pivotal battle, chose to end his own life by falling on his sword. His absence in the conflict had denied his men a share of the glory, leading to this desperate act. These events reportedly unsettled the Roman Emperor Nero to such an extent that he contemplated a complete withdrawal from Britain. Nonetheless, 
as the rebellion had been decisively quashed, the Roman occupation of Britain endured. Concerned that Suetonius's punitive measures might incite further uprisings, Nero replaced him with the more conciliatory Publius Petronius Topilianus. This transition aimed to temper the situation and alleviate the potential for additional rebellions. Despite the suppression of Boudicca's revolt, the British Isles would continue to witness resistance against Roman rule. Venutius of the Brigantes would later lead another rebellion in 69 CE, although this revolt is less thoroughly documented than Boudicca's, but potentially more successful. The Battle of Watling Street thus marked a significant episode in the ongoing narrative of Roman rule and indigenous resistance in Britain. Boudicca's revolt and her defeat became legendary, both among the Romans and the Britons. While the Romans saw it as an example of their military superiority and divine justice, for the Britons, Boudicca became a symbol of resistance and national pride. Her story has been passed down through generations and continues to be celebrated as an example of courage and determination against a foreign oppressor. On this channel, we are putting together narrative historical cinematic battles. Make sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.